Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to Green Home New York City's February 2021 Forum. Uh, my name is Zoe Ferguson. I am a forums volunteer with Green Home New York City. I live in Westchester, and I am very excited to be running this event with everybody. I wanted to thank um, the amazing team at Green Home New York City who put together this event for tonight, uh, Jenny Nicholas, Matt Shirtliff, and uh, Harris Krismanik, who put together this event as a team. Green Home New York City is an all volunteer nonprofit organization. Um, we work to promote sustainability and energy efficiency in the built environment. Um, we also do a lot of careers and uh, events, networking events. Of course, these used to be more in person, but they tend to be in this format now. We have a upcoming events about one forum every month, and we always have career sessions and volunteer orientations. So please check out our blog. Um, if you have any interest in volunteering, there are always availabilities for all kinds of people. We have three main programs. As I mentioned, we have green careers programs every Tuesday, second Tuesday of each month. These are great events if you're looking to get into a green career or uh, figure out some new green career for yourself. We also have a monthly forum on the third Wednesday of the month, for example, tonight on different topics under the larger sustainability umbrella. And then the green building tours that we typically would do in person. Some of them we are able to do virtually, hopefully in person again soon. So that is a way that we get to see all kinds of different sustainability measures going on in and around the city. And of course, the blog on the Green Home New York City website and the newsletter give updates on all kinds of legislation, community action, and different initiatives. So again, like I mentioned, it's an all-volunteer organization. We don't have any paid staff. Um, and there's a really great uh, message to be sent by the amazing things that the volunteers have been able to um, get done. So tonight, I'm very excited to introduce our expert panel of speakers about climate action movements. We have three speakers, Allison Considine, who is a campaign representative from the Sierra Club, Matt Shirtliff, who is a hub coordinator for the Sunrise Movement, and Cameron Bard, who is national co-chair of Clean Energy for Biden. So these are different examples of people who are working on behalf of climate action movements. These movements have been organizing for years to elect progressive candidates, shape the agenda, pass legislation on a local, state, national level. So we're going to be addressing how effective these movements are, their goals, and whatever other insight we can get here. So first, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Allison Considine. She is a New York State campaign representative for the Beyond Coal campaign at the Sierra Club. She helps lead statewide strategies, for a just and equitable transition to a 100% carbon-free electric sector. She previously was a New York campaign representative for the Sierra Club's Clean Transportation for All campaign, uh, supporting transportation electrification, public transit, and reducing emissions from vehicles. She also served as a fellow for Attorney General Letitia James's election campaign, and she was a union organizer with the California Nurses Association supporting nurses across the country and forming unions. She graduated from Cornell University with a BS in industrial labor relations with minors in French, law and society, and feminist gender sexuality studies. Uh, so she didn't do anything really. Originally from Rochester, she lives in Brooklyn now, and she is passionate about biking, universal healthcare, and last but not least, building a powerful movement to confront the climate crisis. So Allison, I'm gonna hand it over to you, and we are excited to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Zoe. Um, Zoe and I know, know each other from college, so it was really exciting to learn that she's also working in the climate space. Um, so yeah, I'm going to um, give a little bit of background on the Sierra Club, um, our Beyond Coal campaign, and then the current focus of the work that I'm leading right now around getting our power sector off of fossil fuels, particularly stopping uh, new fracked gas power plants. Um, and I'll also give some shout outs to other elements of our climate campaigns in New York. So next slide. Um, so if folks don't know, the Sierra Club is um, the nation's oldest and largest grassroots environmental organization. We have 3.8 million members and supporters across the country. Um, and our national network of volunteers, advocates, activists, families, um, 
are really plugged into a whole host of environmental issues. We have folks working on lands and water protection, um, fighting to create more state parks and protect national monuments, um, fighting to change legislation and regulations at the federal level for clean air, clean water, and to protect species. Um, and then we also run uh, a variety of climate campaigns, including the Beyond Coal campaign, um, which has really been a pivotal part of working to shut down fossil fuel power, um, starting with coal and in states where we are beyond coal, which New York is one of, um, really starting to take on the oil and gas industry um, and coal plants. And we work in a huge variety of coalitions um, and in partnership with a ton of different organizations and nonprofits um, to build a really diverse and inclusive environmental movement and to make sure that as we transition off of fossil fuels, that transition is just and equitable and actually creates an economy built on high road unionized jobs. Um, and that puts those communities that have long borne the brunt of fossil fuel pollution first, um, as far as building the new economy and benefiting from investments in clean energy. Um, so we are a, a wide ranging organization, um, but in New York, I'm gonna focus in on, um, like I said, our Beyond Coal campaign. We also have a structure where um, we have both our campaigns, which I'm staff of, and our chapters. So in New York, we have the fabulous Atlantic chapter um, who lead a variety of legislation, not just on climate and clean energy, but also um, to get toxics out of our water systems. Uh, they've been working to ban PFAS and other forever chemicals, um, protect pollinators, and do a variety of other work. So there's really a lot of ways um, folks can plug into Sierra Club. Uh, next slide. So our Beyond Coal campaign um, is really an attempt to bring both our people power from our, you know, millions of members and supporters and volunteer volunteer teams um, into partnership with our legal advocacy, our um, research and analysis, and our coalition work to shut down fossil fuel power, um, targeting coal plants across the country and building a 100% carbon-free grid. Um, and this isn't just a clean energy issue. This is also, of course, a huge public health issue. Um, and beyond just shutting down coal plants, we also do a lot of advocacy um, in the utility space to make sure that utilities are planning and procuring clean renewable energy and to make sure that there are durable solutions for the after effects of our fossil fuel dependent economy, like coal ash cleanup. Um, and um, trainings and, and off ramps and, and state support for workers who um, were employed in the fossil fuel sector. Um, so in New York, we have um, folks like myself, I'm our campaign representative, and we also have organizers, um, really powerful volunteer teams all across the state um, who work together with our Atlantic chapter to shut down fossil fuels. Um, and in New York, or next slide. So in New York, um, we have shut down coal. Hooray. <laughs> um, in 2020, the last coal plants were fully phased out in New York. Um, from 2007 to 2018, we, we went from 21 million megawatts, megawatt hours of coal to 1 million. Um, so it really goes to show, even though our state is a lot further ahead than some of them. That isn't something that just happened overnight. Um, it took a lot of work and organizing, um, but we did it for coal and uh, now it's time to tackle the rest. So um, our campaign is focused on stopping all other fossil fuel generation. So currently 68% of New York's energy grid um, is run on fossil, fossil fuels like frack gas and oil, um, which really is incredibly harmful to people's health. Um, incompatible with meeting our climate goals um, and is a system that isn't gonna sustain us um, in the coming decades. It's increasingly not financially viable um, and it's really standing in the way of bringing on the kinds of clean renewable energy that our grid needs to be powered by. Um, so I think we really see supporting clean renewable energy as a strategy to get us off fossil fuels. Um, we're never gonna be able to shut down these plants if there are reliability concerns or you know if people are worried about the lights going off. Um, but those are sort of false 
false concerns right now, given that we have um, a massive amount of offshore wind in the pipeline to be built. We have land-based wind uh, across New York State and a lot of solar and wind projects that are in development. Um, and we'll hopefully have a smoother road to getting built thanks to advocacy that has happened over the past few years to streamline the process um, to get renewable projects up and running. And then another focus of our climate campaigns, like I mentioned, is building a just and equitable transition to that economy. So we work in close partnership with environmental justice groups, with labor unions and labor organizations um, to really try to center equity in all of our campaigning, um, support frontline communities, and create good family sustaining jobs. Um, and really just to make sure that the sort of pitfalls of our historic energy system, which has been fossil fuel dependent, which has um, been built in areas where, you know, fence line communities are predominantly low income and communities of color. Um, and that increasingly don't represent the workforce um, of New York. So we're trying to kind of take an integrated approach to shifting our power grid. Next slide. Um, but like I said, my current focus is on stopping new frack gas power plants. Um, Thing I'm very excited about. So as folks know, maybe, um, New York has banned fracking a couple of years ago. So activists and advocates and elected officials all kind of looked at the evidence of the harmful effect of fracking on people's water, air, um, health, and the climate and said, you know what, the Marcellus Shale isn't going to get touched in New York. This is a no-go for us. Um, and that was a huge victory. But it didn't mean that our power sector went off gas. It just means that we're importing it from other states. Um, and there's been many fights to stop pipelines, but we also need to stop um, it at the site that it's being used, um, which is the power plants. So next slide. So currently we're involved in three specific plant fights. Um, one is to oppose the Dan Scammer Energy Project, um, which is in Newburgh, Newburgh, New York, and the Hudson Valley. Um, there was a, let me pull up that number, um, a 530 megawatt plant there, which burned um, frack gas. And they're now proposing to build a new plant there, um, which will be 550 megawatts and will still burn frack gas. Uh, and they're trying to frame it to the community and to the state as um, a proposal that is necessary for um, our power grid, which like I mentioned earlier, it's really not. We have um, a variety of transmission upgrades, battery storage, um, energy efficiency, and renewable projects that can easily um, provide that power to the grid. Um, and they're saying that they will just shut it down um, or switch to false solutions like green hydrogen or renewable natural gas um, in 2039. Because um, in 2040, New York State has a mandate to have a 100% carbon-free grid. Um, and this was part of the landmark Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which passed in 2019, which set out mandates for New York to have a 70% clean energy mix on the grid by 2030, 100% by 2040, and then economy-wide, 85% emissions reductions by 2050, um, and being 100% net zero. So that other 15% needs to be um, covered by offsets. However, you would think, you know, looking ahead, 19 years seems like not a time amount of time worth building frack gas power plants. But unfortunately, these companies are pushing forward and are investing a huge amount of money to try to get these projects built. Um, so, like I mentioned, there's Dan Scammer in Newburgh. Um, additionally, an energy company called NRG um, has a proposal to build a new plant in Astoria, Queens, on the site of a plant um, that is shutting down because the air quality from the burning of fossil fuels um, and the rates of nitrogen, nitrous oxide, um, PM 2.5 and other harmful pollutants are too high from the existing plant. Um, so rather than shutting down and taking away the source of an immense amount of community harm and climate harm, um, they're proposing to build a new plant there. And then we're also supporting the work of the Peak Coalition, which is a coalition of groups such as the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, UPROS, um, based out of Sunset Park, uh, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and the Clean Energy Group, who are fighting um, a similar proposal in Gowanus to build a new plant on the site of an old one. Um, so all these proposals really are 
part of the same problem, which is that even though the state has these mandates for clean energy, um, they haven't quite shifted to saying, we know that if we're gonna meet those mandates, we can't be bringing any new fossil fuel power onto the grid. So we're working in coalition with a variety of partners from the Democratic Socialists of America to Food and Water Watch um, and many community-based groups around these plants to oppose them. Um, and those fights are really gonna be ramping up over the next year. Um, these energy companies have put in applications um, to get permits to build the plant. And so we are expecting um, a variety of public hearings and common opportunities over the coming months, particularly um, around Dan Scammer and Astoria to basically weigh in um, and allow the community and public a chance to weigh in and say whether they think these projects are necessary. Um, next slide. So touched on some of this already, um, but essentially uh, the permitting processes for these plants, some of them are going through the Department of Environmental Conservation, others are going through the New York State Board on Electric Generation and Siting, the Siting Board. Um, and like I said, even though we have clear clean energy mandates, and I think beyond just laws and mandates, we have a, a real moral duty and urgency to get fossil fuels off the grid as soon as possible. Um, they're still looking at these plants. Um, and just to give an example of, you know, where I come up with the idea that they're not necessary, um, Con Ed, who, you know, some people would call a climate leader, some people wouldn't, um, themselves have said that transmission upgrades, which are necessary in any event to um, unbottle blockages in the grid and make sure that different load pockets in the New York City area can be served. Um, Con Ed basically said, we can make transmission upgrades that we would like to make and that are gonna be necessary as more renewables come on the grid, which will completely obviate the need for the Astoria frack gas power plant. So there's a variety of solutions um, that can be put into place uh, in all of these locations to serve all of these needs. Um, and you know we're fighting to implement them, but um, really these plants are, I think just an incredibly short-sighted um, answer to a problem which the whole state needs to, you know, be actually devoting our taxpayer resources towards of how are we going to make sure renewable projects get built? How are we gonna massively ramp up our battery storage solutions? Um, and how are we gonna fix our aging transmission system to make sure that those renewable resources get to people's homes and businesses and keep the lights on? Um, and Governor Cuomo really has the power to stop these plants. Um, he appoints the members of the siting board um, and has the power to direct the DEC to uh, deny these permits and make sure that we can refocus our resources on those clean renewable solutions. Um, and so we really think that we need a ban on all new gas fired power plants. Um, and we are working through a variety of um, means to get that done, including the Climate Action Council, which is um, the implementation body of that climate law that I mentioned before, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Um, and we're looking at a bunch of other means as well, because millions of activist hours, um, advocate hours, community member hours are going into asking the state, please stop allowing fossil fuel companies to poison our air, poison our water, um, and put us even further back on the road towards a carbon-free future. Um, and so that's a focus of a lot of my work. Next slide. Um, but really the, the crux of this is that I think the heart of Sierra Club's climate movement and um, all climate movements is people power. Um, we are never going to have as much money um, and lobbyist hours to throw at the state as fossil fuel companies are. Energy alone has spent $600,000 on lobbyists since 2019 to promote this um, project in Astoria. Um, but we beat back these efforts and we beat back these efforts on coal and we're beating back these efforts all across the country with people power and community members, activists and organizations coming together and making it more challenging for um, decision makers like Governor Cuomo to permit these plans than it is to deny them and really giving them no choice and giving them the political cover to do the right thing and um, make choices that are actually aligned with a livable future. Next slide. Um, so yeah, like I said, you know, the 
um, inertia is on the side of fossil fuel companies. Um, the media often, you know, promotes a lot of stories which center opposition and skepticism and false narratives um, about new technologies or carbon capture and storage saving us when um, the most durable and immediate and feasible solutions are right in front of us, building renewable energy, upgrading our aging grid, installing battery storage, and stopping um, these efforts to make the hill that we have to climb to get to a carbon-free grid even steeper. Um, and so really it's people coming together that does this and people showing that we have the political will and the political might um, to demand a livable future. Next slide. So um, the way our climate campaigns work, um, like I said, is a combination of a whole bunch of factors, including coalition building and organizing, um, mobilizing elected officials against projects, public education and media attention, overwhelming um, processes at the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Public Service Commission, which regulates our utilities and our energy sector um, with public comment and opposition, um, filling hearings with hundreds of people, intervening in proceedings and a lot more. Um, and on the right-hand side of this slide, I have a couple links to the campaigns against these plants that I've mentioned. So for Dan Scammer, you can go to stoptheplant.org and sign the petition there. Um, you can go to that little bit.ly for Astoria where there's a link to submit comments to the governor and uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, and I'm going to drop a link in the chat to um, a page to submit comments to the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. And you might be like, wait, we haven't talked about that yet. Um, but basically to build that clean renewable energy, we also need to show support. So we can't just be coming out in opposition. We have to be coming out in support for projects too. Um, and there's a proposal to build a wind, shore, a wind farm off of Long Island, the South Fork Wind Farm that is all ready to go. It just needs approval from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, and they have public comment open right now. And so um, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat for you to go in and um, send a message to uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Man Management and say, I'm a New Yorker and I want wind power off of Long Island. Um, and, you know, I think there's a ton of ways to get involved in climate action movements. Um, Green Home New York City is a fantastic organization. Um, we always welcome new members and supporters. We have some really powerful volunteer teams who do everything from letter writing to lobbying um, in New York City and across the state. And I think, um, you know, it might feel overwhelming, um, especially as we see the uh, really scary effects of our changing climate happening right now in, in Texas and um, across the country. But I think hitting them at the source and stopping fossil fuels and demanding a future um, that is clean and livable and recognizing that if these projects move forward, that future gets further and further away. Um, that's really something that everyday people can get involved in and where a huge number of skills are really needed and useful. Um, I think I might have one more slide, but I think that might've been it. Let's see. Yep, that's all. And I've included um, our New York City organizer's email, Shay O'Reilly. He's out of office right now. So don't expect a snappy response. And I've also included my own email. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Allison. That was fantastic. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, we will have each speaker discussing their work and their projects, and then we will have everybody after presenting answer any questions that the audience might have. I think we're already getting some questions. So again, thank you so much, Allison. Uh, the next speaker that I'm happy to introduce is Matt Shirtliff, a hub coordinator of Sunrise Movement Morris County in New Jersey which is a national youth movement to stop climate change and create millions of jobs in the process. Over his career, Matt's been the Director of Sustainable Programs at Aaron Construction, a sustainability consultant at Great Forest, and an Environmental Peace Corps volunteer in Romania. He has a Master's in Sustainability from Columbia University. So Matt, I am excited to hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zoe. And I'm um, just waiting for this slide presentation to pop up. Excellent. So um, 
I want to thank uh, Green Home uh, New York City uh, for having me speak about the Sunrise Movement. I have to admit, I have an inside track since I'm also a Green Home New York City volunteer. Um, as someone who has been involved in the organization going back a decade sporadically, I want to make a plug to any newcomers this evening to get involved. Uh, in 2012, I got a full-time job because it was listed on the Green Home New York City website. And nearly 10 years later, I am in the middle of interviewing for another job because of a Green Home New York City connection. So looking for work is always hard, especially in this economy, but it's about networking. And Green Home New York City is really the type of organization that allows you to meet people by joining up and then you build your network. Um, so that said, with that said, to the topic at hand, um, and is this my slide? The next uh, slide, please. No, we're still on Sierra, I think. Yeah, I'm still seeing Sierra too. Yeah, we had, there we go, that's it. Excellent, thanks so much. Um, so following up what Allison said, there's um, a good number of similarities um, between uh, her work and what um, Sunrise is doing in terms, you'll hear a lot of similar terms, frontline communities, inequality, jobs, gas, power, gas fired power plants, people power. The difference is, is that while um, her organization is the oldest in uh, the United States, we are basically the youngest. So I am going to try and make up for that by having more slides than she did. Um, so um, what I'm going to be going over tonight um, is I'm going to be talking about the Sunrise Movement both nationally and in Morris County, where I am from in New Jersey. I'll talk about our missions, our principles, our tools, um, and the actions that we have taken nationally and locally. Uh, I myself am a coordinator for the Morris County, New Jersey hub of Sunrise. And what that means is that I am a part-time volunteer. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner of the slide, you will see the shape of Morris County as well as our symbol. Um, and we are in North Central New Jersey. Uh, next slide, please. So Sunrise is a national uh, not-for-profit. It's a 501c4. And directly from the website, I really can't say it any better than um, what is stated about our mission. Um, so this is a youth movement. We are out to create jobs. And we are want to make climate change a priority in terms of ending corrupt influence of fossil fuel executives and electing leaders who are going to stand up um, to really fight um, this existential crisis. And next slide, please. So these are our principles. I'm not gonna read the, through them, but I will elaborate on them. Um, so talking to people to spread the word. Um, if any attendees tonight are organizers, you know the drill, you just talk to everyone. Uh, when I was promoting a Morris Zoom meeting late last year uh, for Sunrise, I obtained a contact list of everyone who had ever signed up uh, in Morris County for a Sunrise event. I then called and texted over 100 people. Uh, a few picked up, some expressing interest, and we were able to garner some attendees that way. One person asked, what Sunrise? And he immediately hung up when I said it was about climate change. So, so goes the movement. In terms of the second point of diversity, when I have been on national organizing calls, it's amazing who you get to talk to. Uh, during the Georgia runoffs, there was a young African-American man, you know, teenager from Atlanta who talked about the hurricanes that had come through his neighborhood wreaking havoc and how he was inspired to get involved politically as a result. Another example from a national call, I spoke to a young man from Kentucky uh, in a breakout room. So, you know, I'm up here in Morris County, which is, you know, basically trending blue politically. And he was down there in deep red Kentucky, kind of by himself as a student, you know, not a lot of resources yet. He was still determined to be involved. Um, the Declaration of Nonviolence. It's something that really appeals to me um, and will come up later in the presentation. 
anyone can take action. Um, the low barrier to entry is something I really like about Sunrise. In other organizations or political parties, you have to apply, be accept accepted, et cetera. At Sunrise, you just do it. Honoring. Um, the national meetings mostly start with an acknowledgement that we are on stolen native land. Um, attendees are encouraged to look up and then post in the chat the indigenous lands that they're on. For example, out here in Morris County, it's Muncie Lenape. Um, finally, this is a youth movement. Um, and uh, one of the most active members out here in Morris County is 14 years old. Um, so there's guidelines for people who are over 35, basically saying, get out of the way and allow youth to lead. Um, if you transpose 35, that's basically my age. So I took this pretty seriously in terms of asking one of the longtime coordinators what my role would be. And her response is like, look, we also have an 85 year old member. So I just try to really um, let the bulk of the um, sub activists and volunteers make their own decisions um, and just provide them support and perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So the tools that we use uh, in order to meet our goal of fighting climate change, um, drawing people into action. Uh, again, any organizers out there, this is familiar territory. Uh, the most lasting volunteers are built by focusing on individuals one at a time. At Sunrise, we try to have initial conversations where we see where the new volunteer is coming from and what issues mean to them. Uh, for mass public support, Sunrise is, we are trying to organize as a movement. So we are always encouraging people to bring a friend uh, to any of the actions. Um, again, repeating from the mission slide uh, two slides ago, um, here's that word corrupt. Um, Sunrise is not shy about uh, where we stand. One recent example, a few months ago in November, then President-elect Biden nominated Democratic Louisiana Congressman Cedric Richmond to serve in the administration in the Office of Public Engagement. Like as soon as that was announced, Sunrise's executive director immediately called it an affront because Richmond has taken more donations from fossil fuel industry than almost any other Democrat. Um, and for training, Sunrise is committed to giving its volunteers tools to be more effective organizers um, and has a wealth of written materials and staff on call to offer advice. Next slide, please. Uh, if you want to boil it down, Sunrise's political objective is the Green New Deal. It's our North Star. You can see um, in this slide the House and Senate authors of the bill on the day that it was launched. Um, of course, there is AOC and then in the center, Ed Markey of Massachusetts. Um, reading through that very general summary, um, you can note how the Green New Deal is not only about environment, but also inequality and injustice as well. Um, this refers to how frontline communities have been hit hard by pollution and the need for employment in those communities as well as generally. And this brings up one of the differences between the Green New Deal, um, which includes a federal jobs guarantee, which Sunrise is very supportive of, versus the Biden climate plan, um, which defends workers' rights to form unions and collectively bargain. So we are very much a, an organization that is out front in terms of societal vision, I guess you would say. Um, also, while the Green New Deal looks to transform power generation completely in 10 years, Biden's plan has a 15 year carbon free timeline. So let's take a look at how Sunrise fights for this goal. Uh, next slide. So in um, around the time of the 28 midterms, Sunrise wasted no time making climate change an urgent priority, uh, staging a sit-in in Nancy Pelosi's office, some of you might remember that, um, where we were joined by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, given that the insurrection just happened last month in January, we're in a whole new context about what it means to occupy a government building. But one of the things that's appealing to me about Sunrise is that they value nonviolence, as I mentioned earlier. 
So as a contrast to now, when Sunrise staged this sit-in um, you know, two years ago, Pelosi said, quote, we welcome the presence of these activists and we strongly urge the Capitol Police to allow them to continue to organize and participate in our democracy. You know, pretty amazing juxtaposition. Um, and a few months later, we uh, members of Sunrise also met with uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein. It was kind of a comical meeting. I encourage people to look it up. Um, and then next slide. So the 2020 election cycle, um, Sunrise really threw itself into primaries to elect Green New Deal champions. Um, I myself have been employed in two different political campaigns in addition to the bio that uh, Zoe uh, talked about. So last year, the entire time I expected to be knocking on doors to ensure a Biden victory and ensure progressive victories. But given social distancing and sheltering in place, it was actually nonstop phone banking. So if you wanna know what it looks like to be a volunteer for Sunrise last year, this is it. I sat in this room with this frame, talking on this computer on um, phone banks. So um, back to the slide. Um, uh, last April, I was on a launch call with uh, Sunrise for Jamal Bowman, who at that time was running in New York's 16th Congressional District. Um, in that slide, you can also see Sunrise's Executive uh, Director Varshini uh, Prakash there on the left. I can't remember the exact number, but the host leading the call quoted what sounded like an insane amount of phone banks that had to take place for Jamal to win. And Jamal was sitting there and you know, he was kind of back from the frame. You could, and you, when, when they announced the number, you could see him go like this and his eyes widened and he was shocked. And like, I thought to myself, there's no way this is happening. They're not getting that many, many number of shifts and he's not gonna win. And he got that number of shifts and he did win. And it was super exciting. Um, so there were phone banks, that was New York. There were phone banks all across the country. Another Democrat that got a ton of Sunrise support was Mike Siegel in Texas's 10th congressional district. He was the Democratic nominee in a rematch against the Republican incumbent. And when I signed up for those Texas um, phone bank Zooms, I repeatedly saw that same 14-year-old volunteer from Morris County that I mentioned earlier. Um, but unlike New York, Texas, uh, we did not win. Um, it was actually supposed to be close, but it reflected the wider underperformance of Democratic candidates in November versus what the polls were predicting. And next slide. Lastly, on the national level, there were the Georgia Senate runoffs uh, just last month. Um, this is a slide I pulled directly from Amaris County Zoom meeting uh, that we had in late December where we were urging people to sign up for the phone banks. Uh, next slide. So um, we engaging with the Biden administration on a national level started all the way last year before they were the Biden administration. You know, during the Democratic primaries, Sunrise's movement rated by uh, Biden's climate plan with an F. Again, we're pretty direct about what we think about things. Um, we endorsed um, Bernie Sanders um, because he was the most um, ardent supporter of the Green New Deal amongst the top tier candidates. But after he suspended his campaign, um, a lot of credit to the Biden uh, campaign. They created six different task force and one of them had to do with climate change. And they invited both AOC as a sponsor of the Green New Deal and Sunrise Movement to join. Um, and as a result, uh, the, the task force developed a number of different um, points. You know, 100% carbon free uh, pollution uh, excuse me, 100% carbon free electricity no later than 2035, creation of an Office of Climate Mobilization, um, spending $2 trillion on decarbonization over Biden's first term, and directing 40% of that investment to frontline communities. So the moment, um, you know, Biden's victory seemed assured around mid-November, Sunrise immediately um, started make, trying to hold the Biden administration 
to account for um, what was in the task force. So, you know, we were pushing for that White House Office of Climate Mobilization. We also pushed for Representative Deb, Deb Holland, currently of New Mexico, I, I think, sorry, to be nominated for Secretary of Interior. And in fact, her Senate confirmation um, hearing it was just scheduled for next week. Um, and then next slide. So that's at the national level, and you could hear all the engagement that um, I had, you know, in those national campaigns. But we're also very local, um, and I joined the local hub late um, in 2020, but they were active in 2019 before they before I got there, um, and some of their main vehicles were, um, you know, in the streets actions um, and in person town halls. So in September of 2019, as a part of the worldwide climate strike, they had a protest at the Morristown Town Hall, partnering with other organizations, um, presenting speakers and gathering a crowd of 200 people. In December of that year, they joined in a protest to, to, to stop the construction of a gas-fired power plant in Newark, um, marching to the headquarters of New Jersey Transit. And this was part of a successful campaign to at least get New Jersey Transit to revise its bid scope for the power plant to include renewables. So that is still up in the air. Um, and finally, there was a town hall focused on local environmental impacts in Morris County like algae bloom as a result of changing temperatures. Um, pictured at the lectern there, Oh, I, I'm sorry, that's actually his campaign photograph, but he led one of the town halls is this great young man named Charlie Baranski, who is a co-founder of Morris County Sunrise, 23 years old, one of the most politically knowledgeable people um, I know. And he ran for a county position and garnered in the primary and garnered 9,000 votes. Um, so uh, next and last slide. So um, the local chapter is also um, involved in trying to hold the Biden administration to account for their climate commitments. Um, and we hit the ground running on the first full day of uh, January 21st. Uh, during the day, we had a die-in uh, outside again, Morristown Town Hall, again, led by our intrepid 14-year-old volunteer. Um, it was socially distanced on a very cold day, and it was gratifying to get that local press coverage that you see in the slide. And then that evening, uh, we had a Zoom meeting where all of our volunteers called, emailed, and wrote postcards to our federal elected officials. You can see an excerpt of this ex really extensive document that I wrote, um, giving guidance about how to talk to our representatives. Um, and um, you know, our message at that point was, we worked hard to get Trump out of office and deliver a Democratic Senate. Now we need our government to act at the scale of the current crisis. So next slide. And thank you um, very much um, for letting me uh, present um, a little bit what Sunrise Morris is about. And I'm just going to uh, drop both my email, which is a green home email in the chat, as well as um, how you can learn about what Sunrise is doing where you are. Thank you so much, Matt. That was very informative and we really appreciate it. Uh, and I am very excited to introduce an excellent segue. We have Cameron Bard here, National Co-Chair of Clean Energy for Biden, which is a network of clean economy business leaders and advocates that was formed early in 2020 to elect Joe Biden for president. Cameron also serves as the Senior Director for Market Development at DSD Renewables. Before joining the solar industry, he served in New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's administration as Chief of Staff for Energy and Finance. Cameron is an adjunct faculty instructor at the NYU Center for Global Affairs, and he frequently guest lectures at colleges and universities across the country. So Cameron, we are excited to hear from you. As a reminder, after Cameron speaks, we will have the opportunity to ask questions of all of the speakers. So Cameron, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Zoe. I really appreciate the introduction. And it's really great to be with all of you. Thanks for joining. I think this marks close to the 10 year anniversary of my first event with Green Home NYC. Uh, as Zoe mentioned, I used to work in New York state government and actually lived in New York for a long time. I'm actually now out 
in Southern California, and I will not tell you what the temperature is. Uh, I'm feeling particularly guilty right now, um, as so many parts of this country are uh, dealing with extraordinary weather. Um, so, you know, I, I as mentioned, I, I do serve as one of a number of national co-chairs with Clean Energy for Biden, and I thought rather than talking to you about what the organization is doing or has done, I might share with you a bit, uh, sort of for the first time, the origin story behind CE4B and how these types of movements and organizations come together, because I do think it's it's not only interesting, maybe I'm biased, but also hopefully illustrious about how you and anyone around you in your network can really organize and put together uh, a hopefully impactful um, apparatus to effectuate change at a political level or otherwise. So uh, really this time last year, we were starting to see uh, you know, some maturity in the democratic primaries. Um, as we all remember, it feels like a decade ago, but it really wasn't all that long ago that uh, we had a very fraught democratic primary. We didn't know which candidate was gonna prevail, um, but about this time last year, we started to see ahead of Super Tuesday, uh, then candidate Joe Biden begin to consolidate some power and some votes throughout the primary process. And really standing on the shoulders of previous organizations back in 2008, 2012 and 2016, these clean tech for Obama and clean tech for Hillary groups, um, a few of us started to realize that there was now room for folks within and across the clean energy industry to once again organize and, and formalize our support for the eventual candidate and nominee. Uh, and I got a very auspicious uh, LinkedIn message at the time, I think it was February um, of 2020, um, from a colleague, not a close friend, but a colleague asking if I'd be interested in helping to revive uh, this kind of clean tech for Hillary group um, and really focus on, on supporting the Biden uh, campaign. And I you know, responded, of course, with enthusiasm and gusto, mainly because uh, A, I believed in the candidate, but also just felt like I couldn't sit on the sidelines. I mean, so many of us had suffered through years of political frustration under the Trump administration. And the idea of just simply showing up in November and casting a vote was nowhere near sufficient for what we needed uh, to do and ultimately what um, our hearts were telling us we had to do. So, you know, I didn't know too much about the 16 efforts, but this felt right. I've been in the clean energy industry for a number of years. I responded saying I, of course, was interested. And little did I know, but, but that was really just the beginning of what would become and, and has been a multi-year effort to really revolutionize how we consolidate and influence politics and power within the clean energy industry. And I say all of that with the best intentions. I mean, when we think about what our counterparts within oil and gas are doing and have done over the previous five to 10 decades, what our industry has done pales in comparison. We are outspent 13 to one on every single political campaign, oil and gas versus clean energy, clean energy for donating to candidates and spending on advertising and lobbying efforts, 13 to one. And when we think about the work of organizations like Sierra Club and Sunrise, they are so instrumental in this fight and organizing at the grassroots level is vitally important for accomplishing our goals and transitioning, not just to a net zero economy, but really actually stopping climate change in its tracks. And we have to play uh, in the space that so many of our competitors are, i.e. inside politics, working in tandem with outside organizing. So how do we reverse that 13 to one ratio? Well, we have to begin organizing our industry and organizing political donors and organizing importantly, grassroots movements. And that's exactly what we tried to do with clean energy for Biden. I honestly thought that we would do a handful of fundraising events and a few speaker panels and GOTV phone banking sessions. I really had no idea what we would accomplish over the following eight months. And it was really astounding and absolutely inspiring to be a part of. So I'm pleased to tell you that uh, I am one of many co-chairs, but I am one of many, 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 in fact, thousands of volunteers who are official members of CE4B. Over those eight months in 2020 through the election, we actually grew to become a 13,000 member 
uh, operation. Um, we raised over $3.2 million and we held hundreds of phone banking sessions for uh, candidate and ultimately President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. And I can tell you, you know, when Allison talks about, you know, Sierra Club operating as a people powered campaign, the same is absolutely true for any successful movement. And it was for us, you know, the co-chairs, we helped to organize and provide some tools and shared platforms and services, but really we had chapters in every single state. Uh, we had over 50 affinity groups consolidating around different technologies and different interest areas. Um, we were committed to diversity, uh, equity and inclusion. And um, we really tried to walk the talk of us building a grassroots movement and effectuating change. We also were very privileged to work very closely with the campaign itself, um, helping to organize fundraising events with the candidate and so many others. I mean, I think about the hundreds of folks that showed up at our fundraising events from governors to uh, congressional representatives, to senators, to previous administrators of EPA. I mean, it's just extraordinary to see what our chapters and local groups were able to do and collectively to step back and realize that we really did have an impact as an industry is really empowering. And this is really for and by the clean energy workforce. We are not a trade association. We were not sponsored by companies. We were not run by CEOs. These are you know, folks who have been working in the clean energy industry, whether they're wind technicians or lawyers or engineers, advocates and activists who care deeply about climate change and care enough to spend their full-time job and to spend their career doing something about it. And so CE4B, you know, there's kind of this moment of, of success and, uh, and happiness, you know, on the day of election, or rather, I guess, in our case, a, a, a week or two later when the final results came in. But we realized that we had built something that could really last beyond the election. And uh, of course, we had to get to work right away to, to ensure that we were able to flip the Senate. Um, and we, we once again ramped up our fundraising and organizing efforts, uh, getting out the vote down in Georgia uh, to get both senators elected. But even beyond then, what could clean energy for Biden really evolve and become? And that's where uh, we as co-chairs and so many other volunteers decided that there was this need for continued political organizing in this space. And we've now announced that we plan to launch formally a 501c4 uh, named Clean Energy for America. So we're dropping the B, replacing with an A, and we will be, you know, of course, independent from the administration. We're going to look to hold the, the Biden administration accountable, um, and we will be advancing the very policies, ideas, and ultimately clean energy champions and elected officials we know we need to tackle these enormous problems. Um, so, you know, it's been so personally gratifying for me to be a part of this, but uh, it is still evolving. Um, if you haven't yet, please do sign up. We still are operating under Clean Energy for Biden, although that soon will be changing. We're going to be hiring an executive director. We're going to be hiring full-time staff. Um, this will become a, a formal entity, and uh, I, I just can't wait to see what we accomplish. You know, one, one or two things maybe I'll, I'll end on here, and I'm eager to get into the questions. I know that there's been a few in the chats already and, and keep those coming. Um, two points that, that I'll make here before we end. One, uh, you know, as I said earlier, our counterparts have been playing this game for a long time and we're in catch up mode. When we think about that 13 to one ratio, when we think about the efforts of the oil and gas and fossil fuel industry, not just to lobby behind closed doors, but to openly support candidates and maintain control and consolidate their incumbency. That's really hard to break. And we have to be really creative in going about it. And that's why I'm so excited to see groups like Sunrise start anew and say, hey, the old ways aren't cutting it anymore. We're, we're going to do sit-ins. We're going to be nonviolent, of course. But we're also going to, you know, go out and hold both Democrats and Republicans feet to the fire and ensure that you are prioritizing this issue that plagues every single one of us day in, day out. So we have to be creative in trying to tackle that. And I think we need to be a little bit more uh, honest with ourselves as an industry and as a movement in recognizing that power and influence are really crucial currencies in this space. And we cannot rest on the fact that these are the right things to do. 
A lot of times we believe that morals and ethics and good ideas rise to the top, and that's just not true. When we are fighting an industry that is so incentivized uh, to continue with the status quo, we have to be equally ferocious and aggressive and creative with our tactics. Um, and of course, you know, staying true to ourselves and, and, and being respectful and being polite and always being nonviolent and um, fighting to ensure that we can really change the status quo and, and, and start to see some of, uh, you know, these, these shifts that we so desperately need. And then lastly, but certainly not least, you know, an emphasis for us early on with CE4B and, and continued on as, as a core uh, element and theme with, with clean energy for, for America is this commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, as an industry, we know that renewables is behind the eight ball. Um, you know, across the board, uh, we are a relatively homogenous industry, and we're starting to see efforts, um, really proactive efforts uh, in this area, but it again is incumbent upon uh, companies and organizations and advocates and activists to ensure that this remains a central core piece of every single action we undertake. Because if we are out there focusing just on building new solar farms and forgetting or deprioritizing who they're serving or the communities they're benefiting, then we're completely missing the forest for the trees. And I, I just wanna drive that point home that just because clean energy for Biden or clean energy for America is an industry driven or workforce driven organization, it doesn't mean that we can forget um, how crucial diversity, equity, justice is and, uh, and should continue to be. So with that, I, I'd love to keep it short and, and turn it over to Q&A and hopefully take some questions here along with my fellow panelists. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Cameron. That was fantastic and really enlightening and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. And all three of you have given really excellent presentations and a lot of things to think about. Uh, we do already have questions in the chat. If I may, I actually wanted to bring up kind of something that Cameron brought up towards the end of his presentation, which is I know that it's, of course, Black History Month. And as Matt mentioned, you know, uh, this country has a lot that we owe to indigenous peoples who were here before settlers came. Um, and I wanted to pose a question to each of you. Uh, or to all of you as a group as to what kind of progress you hope to see or that you envision happening in the coming years as we move forward. Um, if you're asking um, the question with respect to diversity, are you, okay. So th that is um, in, interesting query in terms of Morris County. Um, Morris County um, is relatively wealthy. Um, and, you know, but it, it does have lower income pockets. Um, it's um, not completely homogenous, um, but it is definitely something that, you know, Charlie, for example, has, has talked about, about broadening the inclusion in our, our movement itself. Um, so it, it's a tough prospect because, you know, it's, I think there are certain silos of social media and there's also silos of your networks locally, who you went to school with, who you work with, um, that um, it's it's not an easy jump to, to make it more diverse, but, you know, both the benefits to the movement of getting people's perspective, because that's what teams are about, is having all of those different perspectives inform your plan going forward. And the fact that historically those are, you know, the oppressed, the underserved communities, like it's really important. One thing I'll say, um, speaking for myself, uh, at Sierra Club, we are unionized staff. Um, through the Progressive Workers Union. Um, and I think within our organization, um, our union, which is primarily led by staff of color and women, um, has been a huge driving force of having our organization um, look at our own practices um, and policies and diversity and seeing where we can do better and really pushing for um, substantive changes in 
um, how our organization works, how we recruit and hire to become um, a more equitable organization and a more diverse and inclusive organization. Um, and there's a cool organization called Green 2.0, which publishes a report that looks at um, various large environmental nonprofits um, and how um, their staff and boards um, actually stack up in terms of diversity um, across gender, race, um, and other factors. And so I think, you know, for a long time, the environmental movement um, has kind of been whiter and older and wealthier um, and more focused on preservation of land than really justice. And I think that that shifting from that to being um, a movement that's centered on justice um, is a process that desperately needs to happen and, and is very much underway, um, but also requires, you know, a lot of self-reflection, a lot of humility, um, and really taking a look at how we've done things wrong in the past, um, owning that harm and building more right relationships um, with groups who've been beating the drum all along that climate um, is not actually just about the environment. It's about community health and um, people power. And, um, you know, in New York City, there's a wealth of um, incredibly powerful environmental justice groups who um, have long centered a framework of intersectional um, climate action from the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance to UPROSE and WE ACT um, based out of Harlem. And so I think really being in strong partnership with them is something that Sierra Club is striving to, um, to do better and you know that we haven't always, always done well. And so I think, um, I'm glad you posed that Zoe because, you know, um, it's it's a really messy history. And I think it's something that um, if we're gonna actually build the world that we deserve, we need to um, really confront that history and and through a variety of things. I'm you know former labor organizer, so I think unions are one of the most powerful ways to confront that. But um, there's obviously a, a ton of ways to center equity and justice going forward and to really um, make sure environmental organizations are also racial justice organizations. Thank you so much. So uh, we have some questions. I wanted to go in order because I know that uh, Karen asked a question a little bit ago. Um, she posed the question, I believe it was while Allison was speaking, but if anybody would like to answer this, I'm sure that they're welcome. Question is, if the transition to renewable energy doesn't happen overnight and we are shutting down Indian Point, how can we quickly make up that energy supply to meet demand? Don't we need those fossil fuels in the interim? I'm happy to take that, but I'm, I'm sure Cameron and, and Matt also have some thoughts, um, but I can speak specifically to some of the questions around Indian Point. Um, so, you know, this is a good question. Um, the idea that, you know, we still need fossil fuels as a bridge to the renewable energy future is one that um, has really been pushed out by that, um, by the fossil fuel industry. Uh, like Cameron said, I think a 13 to one um, spending ratio really does infiltrate into our, our media and, and public messaging. Um, but in the case of you know, the Indian Point retirement, um, the New York independent systems operator, which um, sort of is responsible for making sure that we actually have the power to serve our grid, um, conducts a reliability needs assessment every two years, um, where they basically do a big analysis and figure out, do we have adequate resources um, existing to ensure the reliability of New York's bulk power system? Uh, and in their most recent assessment, which was in 2018, they concluded that even with Indian Point's retirement, there's no reliability concerns for New York's electric system over the next 10 years without a new plant at Dan Scammer in the Hudson Valley. Um, and on the topic of Astoria, like I mentioned, uh, Con Ed has found that transmission upgrades would um, erase the need for a new plant at Astoria and at Gowanus. Um, and so we also have a, a very large increase in proposed renewable projects in New York. Um, we recently had two of the largest offshore wind procurements in the nation um, for, um, I'm forgetting the exact number of megawatts, but enough to um, power thousands and thousands of homes. Um, and we're expecting more and more of those to be built. Um, so that concern, I think, comes from a, a really valid place of, you know, we're seeing how scary it is when um, there isn't reliable power, um, but we really have both the renewables being built currently and a bulk system currently that doesn't require us to bring any new fossil fuels onto the grid. 
I was going to add, um, you know, I served in the Cuomo administration when we both announced the phase out of coal by 2020, as well as the, the planned closure of Indian Point for two different reasons. But, you know, Karen, I think your question gets at um, something that was also asked kind of later on in the chat around disinformation, around climate change and renewables. I mean, we've been hearing for decades from both Republicans and Democrats that we're not quite ready for a renewable transition. We're not quite ready. We need a bridge um, from natural gas. We need an all of the above strategy. Uh, I mean, just, you know, one president ago, we were still supporting um, distributed generation powered by fossil fuels as part of the overall energy mix. And I think that those narratives really hold us back. Um, and the fact of the matter is when you talk about Indian points phase out, Allison mentioned a ton of great uh, alternatives and solutions that can be slotted in, in addition to the growing pipeline of offshore wind farms that are planned, in addition to the possibility of importing clean hydroelectric electricity from Canada, which some folks may feel differently about, but, but could in fact provide nice baseload power, in addition to the many more large and distributed scale solar and wind projects that are planned and in queue, I think we have to, instead of prioritizing um, you know, kind of current mixes and being delicate with how we rearrange them, really demand that we move as quickly as possible to 100% carbon-free power uh, and kind of work backwards to ensure reliability from now until then. Um, you know, the same way that we're seeing disinformation in Texas right now around technologies to blame for power outages, uh, you know, what's happening there and what's happened in California before, those are the opposite of what we want to achieve through a big, robust Green New Deal-like movement. Um, in fact, if we had implemented uh, something akin to the Green New Deal, I don't think we'd be in this situation. Um, so we really need to focus on on not just the end goal, but how we get there and ensure that of course, reliability be a part of it from now until then. Thank you so much. Uh, so I want to make sure I am getting different questions. So I know that Cameron just mentioned the question about disinformation related to climate change uh, and topics and industries that are related. And I'm sure we could go on and on about this for possibly days, uh, but I wanted to pose the question to all of you and see if there are any comments that any of you may have in response. Well, um, education, I think, is essential. We're pitching an energy efficiency strategy that's off everybody's radar screen. It's the maintenance of cooling equipment refrigeration and AC units, uh, coil cleaning, filter replacement. The Carbon Trust did a study in 2018, and if you extrapolate their global numbers down to New York City, dirty AC and refrigeration units in the five boroughs of Manhattan are causing possibly as much as 25% of the stationary energy emissions of New York. Nobody's looking at it. And that's a specific energy efficiency strategy. The problem is you have to herd the cats. You have to get 10 million owners of these units to do basic maintenance on them. And that's a real, real problem. Thank you for mentioning that. Thank uh, you. I think that's something that Green Home definitely has on its radar because we talk so much about the built environment. Uh, in terms of the different messages that people are receiving, do Allison, Matt, Cameron, do you have any commentary about uh, disinformation that we are getting and what we might be able to do to fight that? I think one piece I would highlight is, um, you know, there's been sort of a dearth of, of strong climate journalism at major publications and the tide's really shifting on that. Um, I think in large part due to the centrality of um, climate change, uh, in this past election um, and groups like Sunrise and, and others really putting that front and center. Um, but I think supporting um, outlets that have, you know, climate verticals that are, are really investing in coverage of climate in a way that um, is accessible and um, sort of pulls the curtain back on 
some of the things that are really confusing. Like before I started working at Sierra Club, I had never heard of the New York Independent Systems Operator. The way our grid works in New York is not really um, accessible for the layperson. And so I think supporting that kind of journalism um, and then also taking the time to um, kind of pause and ask yourself, you know, what stories aren't being um, told, what angles aren't being told when you hear about things like, um, you know, energy saying, oh, we, uh, we need to build this plan. Otherwise there could be brownouts in New York city. And kind of when you pull back the curtain on that, there's actually um, a lot, a lot more going on that isn't necessitating fossil fuel, but is, you know, necessitating a, a wide variety of upgrades that are maybe a little less, um, you know, easy to talk about than, than just, oh, let's just put up another plant. Let's just continue investing in this. So I think uh, supporting supporting good journalism and media um, and taking the time to get involved and, and do your own self-education and talk to people you trust and understand, um, you know, the fears behind those kinds of concerns and those kinds of messages and pushing to a place of um, empowered action to confront those fears. Yeah, I, just to piggyback on that a bit, I mean, I think the best antidote to uh, disinformation is uh, good, high quality journalism and fact based information. So, um, to hopefully lead you with, uh, leave you with two action items you can take now, there's two newsletters that I read every week, and they have paid subscriptions and they also have free subscriptions. Um, one is called Heated by Emily Atkin. She's a really wonderful independent journalist who covers climate change and is doing tremendous investigative work on these issues, really exposing a lot of the incumbent fossil fuel interests throughout uh, both politics as well as corporations and, and our business world. And then the second uh, is, uh, is called Volts from David Roberts, who used to be of, of Vox.com. He's now doing his own independent journalism, uh, again, with the newsletter. Uh, and he's very wonky, very wonderful, um, kind of creates digestible, uh, you know, piece of information on this space. He just did a whole host and series on transmission upgrades, which we so desperately need throughout the country. Uh, Giannis, those are great questions. I'll type these here in the chat after I start, after I stop speaking. Um, but we, it's, we have to be well read in these issues. We cannot wait for the Wall Street Journal editorial board to tell us what's going on in Texas, or even the New York Times editorial board to tell us, uh, you know, the latest on climate change. We have to seek out good fact-based information on these subjects and move beyond the headlines. You know, reaching carbon-free power grid by 2035, that's just the very, very beginning of the actual issue. You know, how we get there is as important as what we need to achieve and, and ultimately why. So, um, I'll, I'll follow up with these two newsletters, but those are two examples of uh, opportunities for us to get better, smarter, and more educated on these topics. So, um, not directly about disinformation, but in, in a related fashion, I would say, for example, climate change denialism. It's out there. Um, now, how do you engage with someone who is convinced that climate change is a hoax? Um, and as a political organizer and as a campaigner, my answer to that is you don't convince them. You move on from them. Um, and I worked in the Bernie campaign and the things in the Bernie campaign that we were taught were very similar to what Sunrise teaches you, which is you're not and, and things that I heard on tons of different phone banks for tons of different candidates in, in 2020, which is you're not out there to have a, a discussion, much less an argument with people. You're out there to find like-minded people. And they may not know that they're like-minded at the beginning of the conversation by drawing them out, talking about what's happening in their lives personally. Then you connect it to issues, you know. You may, um, in Texas, for example, for, for you might be able to have a wake up moment for certain people about the reliability of, of the grid down there. For people who are dead convinced um, that, oh, it's colder now, so climate change is um, not real, it's proving the point. It's like, you don't talk to those people, even though they're running on disinformation. You talk to the people who, either are fully in your court or somewhat in your court, and then you get them to be active. You get them to get on phone banks, 
to call their representative. You get them to write letters. So, you know, you increase their power and their voice. And even though that disinformation is still out there, you are having the political impact where the decisions are being made to get done what needs to happen. Uh, to happen. Thank you so much for all your answers. That's a really nuanced look from everybody's perspective. And I think that might be really helpful for everybody on this call um, to think about all those different perspectives. Um, speaking of perspectives, I think we had a question from Liza about whether there are differences in the younger generation in their climate activism. I believe this was directed toward Matt because you mentioned the fact that you work with such young people. Is there anything we can learn from them? Is there anything that they do that maybe is more effective or fresher than things that we as probably not teenagers are doing? Um, well, I mean, in the case of the, the middle schooler, like his unbridled enthusiasm blows me away. I mean, I've kind of had political attitudes all my life, but I never was as committed as, as he was. Um, and I never, we never had a school-wide movement to have any kind of strike for an issue, you know, and this is happening in high schools and middle schools. Um, so um, I, in terms of learning from um, young people in that respect, I guess it's like, you follow their example. I mean, we, as uh, people who have been through life experiences may have perspective and, and wisdom, but it's, um, they're kind of showing us up. You know, they're throwing the gauntlet down that we have to, to follow them um, in terms of their commitment. Um, and, and, you know, that commitment comes out of the fact that their timeline is much longer. And when they think about the degree of Celsius rise, it's really going to impact them. But I think it would be their commitment would be what we would learn from. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, the uh, some of the youngest people, I think, have been some of the strongest voices that we are hearing and maybe can be part of the war against disinformation, as much as I hate to use that military metaphor. Uh, I also wanted to get some more questions from the chat here. We only have about 10 minutes left. So if you do have a question, um, please feel free to put it in the, in the chat. I believe somebody asked um, if we could give the contact info and the names of each of our speakers. I think that um, Matt and Allison both gave their I'm, I could be wrong, I'm sorry, Matt, I can't remember exactly, but I believe they both gave their email addresses. Um, and if uh, we are sending a message to follow up with all of you, I think we may be able to give that information. Um, if the three of you have contact info that you'd like to share, please feel free. Uh, we also will be wanting to share the links that we've been getting, um, you know, that like, for example, what Allison shared, uh, the different links that the three speakers have shared. So in terms of other questions that are coming into the chat, I wanted to point out that there are a lot of different perspectives about um, speaking with people who are maybe you know, climate deniers or who are having a hard time understanding what, what we're looking at, what's going on. And you know, Matt pointed out that it can be more helpful not to engage with people who are not convinced that there is any way this could be really happening. And I'm wondering if each of you might have some perspective on how that diversity of audience, perhaps is a way to put it, influences the work that climate action movements are doing. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a hard question. Um, you know, I think being in this space requires you to be critical, not cynical, um, to be open-minded, non-judgmental, but to be really action-oriented. I mean, we just don't have enough time to sit around and debate about whether or not climate change is real. Like that's not a debate anybody on this line should ever have in their life. 
Okay, like I'd rather have you spend five minutes going to Allison's website and signing 10 petitions to get clean energy projects built than try to convince somebody in your life that the world is heating. Um, so, you know, I think all of us, and there was questions about, you know, foreign emissions. This is a global problem and it requires us to focus on what we can achieve as individuals and as collective movements. So what's in front of you right now? Are you in Morris County and can you sign up for Matt's Sunrise Movement and get to work, phone banking for great candidates, signing petitions, helping to stop new frack gas, gas pipelines with Allison? Like, what can you do? You've already heard a number of great ideas. And then in terms of, you know, where you want to spend your time and effort with your career, it sounds like, Richard, you're working in energy efficiency and trying to drive you know, cleaner solutions in New York City. That's wonderful. There are so many jobs being created every single day in this industry that I have no doubt if you are interested in making a move or uh, want to advance your career, there is a home for you across clean energy and across the climate movement. And, you know, in terms of combating disinformation, we need to support good journalists and fact-based information but let's not waste our time trying to, you know, focus on this, thankfully, decreasing slice of, of society that, you know, is, is late to the game and doesn't believe in what we do. I, we need to fight against the actual opponents, which are those that are spending real resources and money to preserve the status quo. We need to fight for the clean energy projects that are really tough to get permitted because of NIMBYism. We need to fight for the gas infrastructure that unfortunately has a lot of capital resources and incentives behind it. So there's so many greater opportunities for us to apply our time. Um, and I think, and I hope that nights like tonight provide you with some ideas on where you can spend it. I just wanna echo what Cameron said in terms of it makes a lot more sense to spend a certain amount of your time signing petitions or getting on phone banks or writing letters than having an argument um, with someone. Um, when I think about like what our audience is, you know, my presentation talked about electing uh, leaders who will stand up for us. And once they, they're they elected, you know, kind of that's to a degree is Sunrise's audience. Um, you know, in New York City is a great example. You start in Queens with AOC, you move up to the Bronx with Jamal Bowman, and then you get into Westchester County um, and across the river with Mondaire Jones. Like, so those, we just want to increase that contingent um, and they are, uh, and the people who will support them in order to move the ball forward. Thank you so much. Uh, I am really impressed with all the discussion in the chat. I have to say that the diversity of perspectives in this meeting is really impressive. Uh, and I wanted to ask if each of you had um, a, a promising trend or a promising uh, action that you would encourage people to get involved in in particular. If there is anything you would like to leave people with coming off of this call, uh, especially if they're feeling maybe like they're not sure where they should start. Um, I think one thing I would leave people with, um, I came to this work through the labor movement. Um, I studied labor in college, like Zoe said, um, and spent a lot of time organizing nurses. Um, and I think the union that I worked for, National Nurses United, really tied together the idea that, you know, if we're going to have um, a truly healthy country that needs a healthy climate and people deserve clean air um, and that these issues aren't separate. And I think um, the lesson from that is you don't need to necessarily even be in a climate group to be fighting climate change. Um, if you're a member of a union, get your union to pass a resolution, um, put pressure on your labor federation to be involved in um, supporting progressive climate policies, progressive candidates. Um, if you uh, 
are involved in your workplace and can push for things like electric vehicle charging stations if we actually ever go back to work in person um, or bike rooms or um, you know divesting your pension fund from fossil fuels. There's a ton of ways um, within the structure of your life and the, the zones where you have influence and where your connections are that you can um, advance the cause of climate change. Um, and I think I would especially give a shout out right now. Um, someone brought this up in the chat. New York State is in the process of um, building out a scoping plan for how we're gonna achieve our climate law and how we're gonna get to 100% carbon free grid. Um, so if you're a member of a community group or organization or have relationships with your local elected officials, um, you know, give them a heads up that that process is happening um, and work with them to make your voice heard. There's public comment opportunities, um, hearings, opportunities to, to weigh in. Um, and really, I think we have to be all in on giving our leaders the political cover to have New York be the most um, energy efficient, renewable energy friendly, um, fossil fuel free state in the nation. Um, because I think that really breaks down barriers and paves the way to make it easier in other states um, with less progressive leadership. Um, and to show that this isn't you know, something that's gonna happen in five years, the technology and the political will is here today. Um, and you know, we have the power to demand it. Matt, do you wanna go or you want me to jump in? Sure, I'll, I'll be brief. So, um... I think what Allison says is is great, and it reminds. You know, I went to Columbia University, and you know, for sustainability, and we had a lecturer there who wrote "Green to Gold," and you know, very early kind of in sustainability. And his point was, don't go get a green job; make your job green. You know, so you know, kind of echoing what Allison said, it's like you can do things where you are right now, in in whatever environment you're in, in terms of your workplace. Um, but if that's, if that's not your thing, um, where to start, you know, for whatever issue you have, there is an organization out there that you can plug into within this space. Um, so um, find out what's most comfortable for you and, and just get involved. And because what you're interested in, um, if you apply it, that will keep you going because that's what you want to see achieved. Yeah, I'll um, I'll maybe round it out, uh, building on those two comments, and also hopefully in the process answering a, a point that that Karen just shared. Um, you know, I Ta-Nehisi quotes the author had this this really wonderful observation about presidential politics and voting that has always just stuck with me since I heard it last year, which is that, you know, voting for voting every four years for the president is akin to like taking out the trash. Like it's something you have to do, but if that defines your role in democracy, that's unacceptable. Like there's so many more opportunities to help push the dialogue and the conversation and the actions of the issues you care about beyond just voting and certainly beyond voting for the president every four years, that you really need to find more opportunities. And so, Karen, to your point and to this question about what should we do and maybe what can we be excited about, I really do think we need to elect clean energy and climate leaders across all levels of government, local, state, federal. And I'm not talking about kind of quote unquote extremists who are willing to do or say anything at the risk of you know, alienating moderates. I'm talking about people who know what they're talking about, who know what they're doing and can help deliver good policies that scale up these industries and scale down the fossil fuel dependency that we have. We know that every single economist uh, prescribes a carbon fee or a carbon tax is the best way to get to net zero. And we also know that every single political scientist will tell you that's not happening. So we need people who are really creative and have ideas that they can bring to government to help move this conversation forward, uh, creating incentives, tax credits, bans on fossil fuels, uh, helping to deliver low cost financing, new incentives, new regulations and oversight and all sorts of ideas and tools of government to help scale up clean energy. And, and like I said, uh, ultimately move away from fossil fuels. And I don't think that's, that's extremist or alienating. I, I think growing our clean energy economy and preserving our very existence um, are attractive. 
on the ballot. And, and climate change, in fact, was on the ballot in 2020, and we saw enormous success, uh, not just nationally, but also, also locally, when these ideas and themes are talked about as part of these races. So um, I guess to sum it all up, elect clean energy leaders and, and be a part of holding them accountable once they get there. Thank you so much, Cameron. Um, you know, that tie in towards the fact that local leaders are important too is a really excellent way to help wrap up this incredible forum that has been really interesting and, and really fascinating. So of course, Green Home New York City is a local organization, but there are, as Matt said, and Allison said, lots of other local orgs you can get involved in. This is uh, an event that's part of our monthly forums program. So as I mentioned, there is a forum every month for Green Home New York City. And our next forum is going to be about green design. It will be about designing for wellness on March 17th from 6.30 to 8. You're right here on the internet. Uh, and we hope that you will join us there. You can, of course, check out our website at greenhomenyc.org to learn more. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me Zoe at greenhomenyc.org. We will send out an, an email with the links and the contact info for the speakers from tonight. And please let us know if we have any questions. Thank you so much for joining us and a huge thank you to our speakers. Of course, we could have done this without you. Uh, wouldn't, have been, wouldn't have been great. And it was amazing to get all your input. We hope that everybody will keep in touch and that we will see you again at another Green Home New York City event. So thank you so much to our speakers and thank you to everybody. I hope we can see you soon.